Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Lois Quam, and I'm the CEO of Pathfinder. Today's event will be taking place in both English and French. And at this time, I urge you to click on the interpretation icon, which is the menu bar of your Zoom screen, and select your desired language, English or French. You'll also note there the setting um, underneath the languages, mute original audio. That deactivates the sound of the original speaker. If it's checked, you won't hear the original speaker in the background, but if it's not checked, you will. So why don't please everyone just take a moment to um, go to the menu bar and make those changes. On behalf of Pathfinder, and our organizing partner, PAI, I'm so pleased to welcome you to today's roundtable discussion, Safe Abortion, Paving the Way for Universal Access. We're thrilled to see that the strong interest in this topic among such diverse participants from around the world. This week, many of us have been attending the Global Equality Forum, and we know that women and girls, youth will never be equal if they do not have autonomy over their bodies. Every year, 25 million unsafe abortions take place around the globe, which account for a substantial part of maternal deaths between 4.7% and 13.2% of all maternal deaths. At Pathfinder, we envision a world where no girl, no woman suffers harm from an unsafe abortion, which is why we are so deeply committed to expanding access to comprehensive safe abortion care through promoting the agency for women and girls to exercise their rights to make their own sexual and reproductive health choices, partnering with country governments and improving integrated and community health systems for sustainable, comprehensive, safe abortion care. Today, our expert panelists will be weighing in on the steps that donors, implementers, and other key stakeholders can take towards making comprehensive abortion care safe abortion care a reality. From envisioning positive policy changes to reducing legal and policy barriers to safe abortion and supporting community-led advocacy efforts aimed at addressing all social injustices and inequities surrounding unsafe abortion. We have a lot to cover and no time to waste. So let's dive in. I'd like to introduce the moderator for our panel, Alicia Dunn Giorgio. Vice President of Policy and Advocacy at PAI. Alicia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Lois. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening again to everyone joining us from around the world. Um, as Lois said, I'm Elisha Dun Giorgio, the Vice President of Policy and Advocacy with PAI. And I will be your moderator for the rest of today's session. We have a really interesting panel uh, for you today. And, and before we turn to all of our panelists, we have the pleasure to be joined by Carmen Jampton, uh, the Director General of CEDA, the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency. And I just wanna take a few minutes to, to ask Carmen some, some questions. Uh, Karen, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you for letting me be with you today. <laughs> it's an important topic to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. So I just wanted to, to hear from you first before we open up the panel. I mean, CETA is, is such an impressive and productive force in, in promoting universal access to sexual and reproductive health and rights across the globe. And as part of that, you have been very active in um, leading and hosting global safe abortion dialogues. And I'm hoping that you can tell us a little bit more about that and share some highlights uh, particularly from a donor perspective, from the latest Global Safe Abortion Dialogue and, and really how the previous dialogues have influenced your work and direction mm -hmm. when it comes to comprehensive abortion care. Mm. Thank you and thank you again for, for giving me this opportunity, but most of all, PAI Pathfinder and UN Women for organizing this uh, very, very important conversation on, on universal access to, access to comprehensive abortion care. Yeah, as you said, the Global Safe Abortion Dialogues, um, the, the, the most recent Global Safe Abortion Dialogue was held, held in April this year. Um, and that, 
the dialogues offer platforms where we as partners from different walks of life, partners and allies can strategize together for an inclusive and equitable change. The first dialogue was held five years ago, 2016 in Stockholm. This was when the common agenda for safe abortion was established. It has of course since then been updated and adapted in different ways. But it has all the time been used, the common agenda has been used as a blueprint to guide conversation, facilitate strategic collaboration, galvanize joint action, um, joint action amongst partners, uh, including us as funders. In the most recent dialogue, participate, participants identified eight, eight cross-cutting priorities as part of our common agenda. Uh, you can today find these eight priorities in the collective commitment that Sweden put uh, launched rather in support of the Action Coalition on Bodily Autonomy and Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights. The commitment has already been signed by 30 partners in, from different walks of life, as I said before, government, civil society, grassroots and international organizations. All of this signaling the strength and breadth of the movement. The discussion during the Global Safe Abortion Dialogue were clear when it came to in, in the importance of intersectional movements working together as equal partners, sharing power uh, and sharing the power meaningfully, of course. And all of us centering the work around the person needing abortion care. There were some asks and the loudest asks were for long-term flexible and responsible funding. Uh, and that is of course also to be able to absorb, absorb, absorb risks uh, and to ensure mechanisms that uh, allows funding for grassroots movements, also through variance in when policies change over time. We also heard asks for more and greater coordination. This included, of course, an ask for, a continued, uh, for continuing to create global and regional platforms, such as the Global Safe Abortion Dialogue, but also time-bound specific collaborations on different topics. I would also like to take this to share some specific highlights from the discussions during the what was called the funders circle, meaning talks uh, between among funders like ourselves and other also private sector funders, et cetera, et cetera. While we as funders recognize that the funding environment for abortion is shifting, we also see opportunities with using a broader framing of comprehensive abortion care, situating it within SRHR, UHC, the universal health coverage and COVID-19 recovery efforts, but also in gender equality, human rights, education, climate justice programming, etc. Another thing that I would like to say is that there is a strong ambition among funders to support movement building. Movement building and, and uh, there is a strong ambition, ambition to actually focus on young intersectional feminist movement, movements. There was also discussion around the need for indicators and reporting measures to better capture advocacy work. There's a great need for advocacy, but we have to report around it and, and tell our populations around what actually happens. Finally, we reflected on the importance of ensuring that the ambition for comprehensive abortion care is tailored and phased to fit the country context. And that we must always remember comprehensive abortion care and move away from the more limited dimensions of only focusing on post-abortion care. After all, Many funders recognized abortion is prohibited altogether in 24 countries. Those are some of the takes from the funder circus and some of the takes from the, the abortion dialogue that was held in, in, in Stockholm, as I was about to say, but it wasn't virtually in April <laughs> this year. Thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Really great stuff there. And it's it's great to see the partnership model and the movement building that's happening around such an, an, an important issue. Um, I'm going to ask you one more thing before we turn to our, our full panel. And I, I'm hoping you could share briefly a bit more detail around CETA's vision for comprehensive abortion care and the TRAP 
top priorities for CETA on this topic? I'll try to, I'll try to be brief. I know there are only a few minutes, but we do a lot. First, and maybe the most important part is recognizing the underlying structural discrimination against women as a core barrier to comprehensive abortion care. And we work to achieve gender equality in all dimensions. Maybe that's the most important sort of stepping stone for all of our work. Sweden uh, supports the entire ecosystem around comprehensive abortion care. Sorry, can I just ask everyone that's not speaking to mute themselves? No. Bridget, could you please mute yourself? Thank you. <laughs> please go ahead, Karen. Thank you. Uh, and we recognize the complexity and that it, it needs a holistic approach. Um, Sweden is also an active advocate for the right to abortion and we stand firm on values in international forums. We will, from the side of CEDA, continue to work towards the progressive realization of SRHR in universal health coverage programs and that abortion is included in essential care packages. We invest in health system strengthening. In this uh, fora, I would like to stress that one important part is the support of, and strengthening and, the, and supporting the leadership of the midwifery cater as central providers of comprehensive SRHR, including abortion. We are a firm believer in collaboration and partnership uh, in different ways. The Safe Abortion Dialogue platform is providing such a backbone for exactly that. And we will continue to work and support the Safe Abortion Dialogue platform as we speak now, the Regional Safe Abortion Dialogue for Latin America has just finished and the Asia Dialogue is still ongoing. We are, CEDA, we are committed to providing flexible multi-year core funding with a focus on those furthest left behind. Sweden through CEDA have made three commitments under the Action Coalition on Bodily Autonomy and SRHR. And I hope that you can hear that often. We are also a partner you can count on when it comes to strategic dialogue and high level advocacy. Gender equality can never be achieved unless we can decide over our own bodies in a safe and dignified manner. And in this work around abortion, our ultimate goal is to shift power to all persons in need of abortion care to make informed decisions about their own bodies. We have committed from the side of CEDA to organize at least one global safe abortion dialogue within the next five years. And in the meantime, we will hold ourselves accountable to the eight cross cutting priorities that we agreed upon as a collective. And I would like to end these minutes by saying that I hope that you will all join us in the commitment and that I will see all of you in the next global safe abortion dialogue. There, I will stop for now and come back in the panel. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you Thank so much, you. Karen. Lots of really great stuff, both in the Safe Abortion Dialogue and, of course, in CETA's um, own vision. I know we all appreciate really your holistic approach and that idea of strengthening health systems and really incorporating abortion access into this, this thing we're all talking about it around achieving gender equality. Uh, I'm sure that our, our panelists will have more to say about these areas, so I'd like to invite them now into the conversation. And just a note to participants, if you have questions for Karin or our panelists, if you can drop them into the, the chat and we will um, take them after we hear and talk with the panel. Uh, so if everyone on the panel could turn your video on, that would be great. And you know, in addition, obviously to Karen, uh, we have the pleasure of being joined by several experts in the field of sexual and reproductive health and rights. Just gonna do brief introductions here. Um, Fatu Janssen, Regional Advocacy Advisor of NSI Reproductive Choices. Riaz Mobarakali, Country Director, Pathfinder International Mozambique. Amos Mowale, the Executive Director of the Center for Reproductive Health and Education in Zambia, and Bridget Siam, the Senior Gender and Youth Program Officer from Pathfinder International in Burkina Faso. Welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us um, and giving your time to talk about this really important issue. 
I'm going to uh, start off with some context setting from each of you, followed by a, a roundtable discussion, and then we can take some some questions from the audience. Um, so I'd like to I'd like to start off with um, you, Fatu, but I just want to remind all of our panelists and a reminder for me too that we're doing simultaneous translation. So if we could speak a little slowly, be kind to our interpreters uh, <laughs> and just be mindful that people are listening in different languages. So Fatu, as someone who, who works for MSI Reproductive Choices, you obviously have a, a wide portfolio, we cover a lot of ground. What are you seeing in, in terms of global and regional context in advancing abortion access? Okay. Thanks, Elisha, and thanks for having me. So I will be talking mainly about the African region, if one can talk about this huge continent. So what is very important is that the countries in the region are at different stages when it comes to abortion access. The legal policy and regulatory frameworks differ from country to country. However, what they have in common is the tension between legal availability, stigma, and opposition. So to illustrate this, I will give a few examples. In Senegal, abortion is totally prohibited, so not even to save the life. Only the medical code of ethics provides for abortion to preserve life, but the code also requires three doctor signatures to provide a service. Given the medical doctor ratio per capita, this requirement makes it de facto impossible for most women in Senegal to access life-saving abortion services. Importantly, the code of ethics has no legal Force. In Niger, abortion is permitted to preserve life and in case of serious fetal abnormalities. However, abortion remains highly stigmatized and opposition is strong. As a result, information and access to services is limited, very limited, and open safe abortion advocacy is a very sensitive issue. In Mali, the law permits abortion in cases of rape and incest and also to preserve life. However, the 2002 sexual reproductive law stipulating this is still not in force as the implementation degree is still, has still not been issued, making the law effectively inapplicable. Parts of East Africa are still largely restricted. For instance, in Tanzania, Uganda, Malawi, abortion is only permitted to save life. Kenya, however, has multiple legal uh, indications for abortion access, but minimal implementation. And in Zimbabwe, massive administrative barriers for rape survivors exist, as well as limitation on the facilities that can provide services. So generally speaking, one can say that access to safe abortion services continue to be out of reach to most women in the region, either because abortion law abortion is prohibited by law or because there are policy and regulatory requirements in place that act as effective barriers to access to information as well as services. And even in less restrictive legal settings, the implementation of these laws and policies often left behind and stigma as well as opposition further limits access. Importantly, for women to have de facto access to quality and stigma-free safe abortion services, it is also crucial that there are clear and comprehensive safe abortion guidelines in place, free and in-service trainings for providers, as well as sensitization, VICA training uh, are implemented and complemented by advocacy efforts around safe abortion commodity and supplies. Thank you, Fatu. That's a great Thank overview you. of the region. Really appreciate it. Um, Riaz, I'm going to I'm going to turn to you now. I mean, Mozambique is, I think, an example of some of those tensions that Fatu mentioned. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, the context in which you're advocating? Sure. Thank you. Good morning, afternoon and evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you for, for giving us this opportunity to share the Mozambique context and talk about our work and how at the country level, we have been prog progressing. Um, before uh, talking directly about uh, abortion, let me give some context of Mozambique because I think that's critical. That's built the case. We are talking about a country we, where we have about 30 million inhabitants, where the majority lives in a rural area. We are talking over 70% in a rural area. And the majority, over 66% of this population are young with less than 24 years. 
with a high fertility rate of over five per woman. And this is really packed with high unmet need for contraceptive services, coupled with low contraceptive prevalence rate. So the utilization of contraceptive services is really low. And that's even worse when we are talking about adolescent and youth. When we are talking about 15 to 19, it's less than 17%. The percentage of pregnancy among adolescent girls is extremely high, 46%. And then the cause of death among adolescent girls is 25% due to pregnancy. So this, this is really a context that builds the case, making us to think about sexual reproductive health, the need of services. And this is all what triggered Mozambique to really walk through take decisions and work around access, creating access to safe abortion as a critical services. And that started actually from the eighties, even at that time when, when abortion services in Mozambique were criminalized, it was against the law, Ministry of Health had placed some exceptions allowing in certain circumstances to have services. And that includes mental health or mental effect. So creating some of opportunity to really have the access. And then we started as a civil society effort by Feiner and other civil society organizations since 2004 with a huge effort uh, working with as a movement to really create a less restrictive environment. And that was heard actually in the civil society uh, pushed very hard on that. And, and as a result, in 2006, the Ministry uh, of Health initiated a consultation in, in country. And that actually led, in 2011, a penal code revision. And with that, only just to, you know, this is, this is very important to see how slowly this progresses and how, how this is impactful throughout this time, because girls, women, doesn't, stop to die during this period. And in 2014, finally, the penal code was approved where the, uh, the, the access to safe abortion was decriminalized, but its implementation started really very late. It was uh, the technical guidelines and everything was uh, developed and allowed to really have uh, in 2016 and by 17, end of 17, 17 and 18, we started with the cascade training and rolling out. So this is just in a nutshell how it went. And it's important to really share. Uh, it takes long, but uh, we have to move it surely and really fight without stepping back. Thank you. Thank you, Riaz. That, that's a really great um, context setting, I think, both in, in the framing that sometimes we talk about abortion access as if it's an individual issue, but in reality, it's tied to so many other health comes and, and health improvements that need to be made um, alongside it, as well as really recognizing that we all feel a real urgency to move this forward, but the bureaucracy, perhaps, if that's the correct word at country level, uh, can really slow it down. Um, and so figuring that piece out from the beginning is, is very important. I'm gonna turn now to Amos um, and ask you to talk a little bit about the Zambia context. Thanks, Elisha, and um, thanks everyone else. I think when you look at the um, Zambian context, we have one of the oldest law when it comes to abortion services. Our law was passed in 1972. It's called the Termination Act of Pregnancy. However, even with that law, we still see that um, abortion services are actually one of the major top five causes of maternal mobility in the country. And then it also takes almost 30 to 50% of the gain word in terms of service provision, either post or before or unsafe abortion services that have been reported. Uh, there are a number of um, barriers that have led to uh, such services not being offered freely and accessible. First and foremost, I think generally there's a, a confusion or there's a mixed feeling in terms of how the citizens perceive whether abortion is legal or an illegal, but in terms of the law, abortion is legal. Secondly, I think there's 
huge opposition, especially that Zambia is one of the countries that has been declared as a Christian nation. So the opposition mostly comes from the religious circles. And then one of the things that we've also noticed over the time is that service providers are one of the key um, barriers sometimes to safe abortion services because they use their personal values when it comes to service provision. So you'd be able to see that as much as the government has a lot of efforts which they have done, one of the things that um, uh, I can mention is that we have clear guidelines. We have safe guidelines, which I can show. Okay, these are safe guidelines for um, uh, standards and guidelines for safe abortion services. But you find that individual service providers have difficulties in accepting, even providing the law, I mean, providing the service as it should be because of their personal values. Secondly, if you look at the Zambian government, they have done much. You know, we have um, ratified the Maputo Protocol. We have also uh, focused on ensuring that the ICPD outcomes are followed. The Beijing uh, platform is followed. Locally in Zambia, we have two good laws that actually ensures that safe abortion services can be enhanced. One, we have the Gender-Based Violence Act of 2011. We also have the Gender Equity and Equality Act of 2015. All these have been made to ensure that they protect the women and access to women's reproductive health services. However, because of lack of information, misinformation, we have seen that abortion debates constantly come in and out and we need to do a lot of advocacy to ensure that people are aware what the law provides and how services should be provided. Over, thank you. Thank you, Amos. Uh, I think what, I, what I'm hearing collectively from Fatu, Riaz, and Amos so far is that laws are necessary, but really the first step in the sort of longer effort to make abortion accessible. Bridget, you are last but not least, Bridget, and I, I'm hoping that you can give us some insight into the context in Burkina Faso. Just need to unmute, I think. Oui. Yeah. And over. Bonsoir. Bonsoir à Isha. Bonsoir à tous les panélistes. Et très contente de retrouver Amos. My English is very bad, so I will express myself and in French in order to be clear. Amos, I'm very happy to see you again. <laughs> okay. Yes, and sorry for my bad English. Practice is, is makes perfect, so I will go in French. Yeah, parlant du contexte de l'accès à l'avortement sécurisé au Burkina Faso, et il faut dire que euh, le Burkina Faso, il y a un tout petit pas de franchi, mais il reste encore à faire. Contrairement à d'autres pays de l'Afrique de l'Ouest francophone, au Burkina Faso, l'accès à l'avortement sécurisé est autorisé à des conditions précises, strictement encadrées. En cas de viol, en cas d'inceste, en cas de malformation fœtale. Malheureusement, il faut dire que ce contexte favorable n'est pas du tout exploité à sa juste valeur. Parce que tout simplement, les femmes qui sont les principales bénéficiaires et les premières bénéficiaires ne sont pas du tout informées de ces dispositions législatives, juridiques, qui peuvent véritablement les accompagner à jouir pleinement de leurs droits en santé sexuelle et reproductive. Deuxièmement, et même le peu de femmes et de jeunes filles informées qui ont connaissance et qui tentent véritablement de jouir de ces dispositions juridiques font face à un certain moment donné à un personnel de santé qui n'est pas du tout favorable à l'offre de services aux soins d'avortement sécurisés. Parce que tout simplement, à travers bien sûr les pesanteurs socio-culturels, les us et coutumes, ce sont des situations qui continuent toujours aujourd'hui de bloquer l'accès de façon paisible. ce qui donne à voir un contexte difficile avec un nombre très croissant de, de filles et de jeunes femmes avec des grossesses précoces non désirées 
et même des grossesses indésirées. Ça, c'est au niveau du personnel de santé. Et malheureusement, ou bien heureusement, je dirais, c'est vrai que la procédure d'obtention euh, de ces dispositions ont, a été, et, et ont été révisées pour favoriser l'accès aux, aux, aux éventuelles victimes, mais malheureusement, n'étant pas informées et aussi souvent se faisant face à, de, à des personnels juridiques qui ne sont pas véritablement informés, Bridget, I'm du coup, sorry, la procédure devient longue parce que ces victimes n'ont pas un écho favorable au niveau de la justice. Excuse me, Bridget, I need to du coup, stop on you assiste for one... à un silence coupable, quand bien même ces quelques femmes-là savent où il faut aller pour pouvoir jouir pleinement de ces dispositions juridiques. Aujourd'hui, ce qui peut être fait pour que les autorités puissent réellement prendre cette situation au sérieux, j'ai identifié trois grands axes. Le tout premier point, il faudrait que l'ensemble des acteurs de la société civile puissent donner une place de choix à la recherche. Parce que qui parle du plaidoyer parle d'évidence. Sans évidence, il sera véritablement impossible de pouvoir convaincre les autorités à faire bouger les lignes. C'est un appel parce que quand vous regardez dans tous les différents pays, la recherche reste le volet et le plus pauvre. Nous avons besoin des évidences, mais malheureusement, l'ensemble des partenaires techniques et financiers ne veulent pas du tout mettre des ressources sur ça. Alors que sans évidence, il nous sera véritablement difficile de faire, d'amener de, de, les autorités à prendre cette problématique au sérieux. Le deuxième point, il faudrait impérativement que l'ensemble des organisations de la société civile puissent aller en rang serré. Plus nous partons en rang serré, nos voix vont compter. Malheureusement, on se rend compte que nous avons un certain nombre d'acteurs de la société civile qui partent en rang dispersé, ce qui ne donne pas un véritable poids à nos priorités de plaidoyer et qui, et, 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 et qui vient en même temps plomber nos objectifs vis-à-vis -vis de ce que nous sommes en train de rechercher pour l'ensemble de ces femmes. Le troisième point, ce que je propose, c'est de pouvoir véritablement soutenir aussi le nouveau profil d'activiste et de militante qui se dessine et qui est en train de faire son bonhomme de chemin en Afrique de l'Ouest francophone. Et je fais un clin d'œil aux féministes, aux activistes qui sont sur les réseaux sociaux, aux blogueuses qui boostent et qui talonnent les autorités en cumulant apprentissage, discussion, co-construction et lobbying vis-à-vis -vis de ces autorités pour les faire prendre conscience et connaissance que cette situation que les femmes et les jeunes filles sont en train de vivre, c'est une situation qui peut être résolue. Ce n'est pas du tout quelque chose de figé. Il suffit seulement qu'une volonté politique forte puisse réellement prendre les choses en main et nous allons certainement permettre à ces jeunes femmes et à ces filles de pouvoir jouir pleinement de leurs droits. Et pour terminer, je dirais qu'au-delà de cette situation favorable, c'est qu'il faut que impérativement les autorités travaillent à donner aussi des éléments de réponse. Quand je prends un exemple de ces quelques rares jeunes filles et de femmes qui ont eu le courage de braver le personnel de santé et de braver aussi le personnel juridique, à un certain moment donné, ils se retrouvent dans un endroit où l'offre de soins cliniques fait défaut. Parce que tout simplement, nous avons une volonté politique qui n'est pas du tout accompagnée d'actes concrets et sur le terrain. Donc, euh, je dirais, euh, voici un peu le tableau peint pour le Burkina Faso, qui côtoie bien sûr d'autres pays pour lesquels la question de l'avortement, la question sur l'accès à l'avortement sécurisé, reste toujours une question. Il n'est pas du tout question de lever le voile. Pendant ce temps, nous avons des femmes et des filles qui meurent parce qu'elles sont victimes d'avortements clandestins non sécurisés, ce qui vient bien sûr augmenter le taux de mortalité maternelle et cela est véritablement lamentable. C'est très brièvement ce que je pouvais partager avec vous. Thank you so much, Bridget. Um, and apologies beaucoup, to the participants uh, because we seem et, to be having a. Uh, where interpretation is all occurring on the French channel. So if people need either French or English translation, please select French right now in the interpretation icon. Uh, and Bridget, thank you. I think um, hearing your comments, they really complement 
um, what our other panelists had said, and also that addition about civil society advocacy and really needing to mobilize effort on this um, and make it you know, acceptable um, as an area for civil society to tackle is, is really important as well. Um, thank you everyone for providing that, that snapshot of the landscape. I think we did a, an excellent job of talking about, about barriers. So now let's, let's talk a little bit about what we're doing to, to remove those, those barriers. And Fatu, I'd like to start with you again. Uh, I mean, we've talked and heard from everyone about the importance of abortion access as a health issue as related to other outcomes. And we're here talking in the midst of the Generation Equality Forum. And so I'd love to hear from, from you to talk a little bit more about the connection between abortion, not just as a health issue, but as abortion access is key to gender equality. Okay, thanks, Elisha. So I'll try to be as brief as possible, <laughs> although quite difficult. So uh, I think uh, gender equality cannot be achieved without access to reproductive choice, right, including abortion because without reproductive autonomy, it is much harder, if not impossible, for girls to stay in school, pursue a career of their choosing, and drive positive, sustainable change in wider society. Importantly, a lack of access to safe abortion care also puts women's lives at risk. No one should risk their life and health for the right to determine their own future. And as evidence has shown, over and over again, laws, restrictive abortion laws and policies do not reduce unsafe, abo unsafe abortion, do not re reduce abortion in general, but force women and girls to resort to clandestine abortion that are often unsafe, thereby forcing them to put their life and health at risk. So, and then another important link that I think uh, needs to be made is the link between reproductive choice, climate change resilience of community and of communities and gender equality. Because as we know, globally communities that contribute the least to climate change crisis are suffering the most with women in the global South bearing the brunt. To build resilience and help fight the climate crisis, we need to protect access to reproductive choice. With reproductive choice, girls can finish education, pursue careers, provide more economic stability when facing a disaster. And with the power to determine their own path, women are more able to take on decision-making roles at community and national levels. And I think it is already, this is evidence nobody's gonna dispute. Participation in decision-making process processes is a crucial factor for achieving gender equality. In terms of, uh, from the experience from MSI, we can say that in MSI programs, we have seen that when women have access to reproductive choice, including access to safe abortion, they are more able to participate in community environmental protection efforts. Data also shows that when women are able to take on leadership roles in governments and companies, they are more likely to make environmental friendly decisions helping to build a more equal and sustainable world for all, all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Fatu. That, that's great. And I, I think it's so important that um, in this Generation Equality Forum, bodily autonomy and choice are really being lifted up as part and parcel to achieving, achieving the major goal. Do any of the other panelists or Karin want to chime in there? Is there anything that you'd like to add? I mean, Fatu, you raised some really interesting points about climate adaptation and resilience and, and others. Um, Bridget, I see your, your hand is up. Do you want to say something briefly? Ok, merci. Um, je voudrais bien sûr ajouter um, quelques idées. I would like to add a few ideas here, and especially to Pathfinder, because for us to have ac equal access, we need actions and strong actions at that. So within our structure, we work through cross-functional work, whether it is all, all our programs, all our projects, but also on an institutional level, because the gender for us is a behavior. We have to provide true information, but you have to give it, live it, and be a live witness for others to understand and show by example so that gender has an equal place. Secondly, what we also did is that we train health workers because it's within those health working systems that young women, girls, 
are present, they provide, they're being provided with those services, and they're being faced with a huge obstacle, depending on where you come from, depending on your education, de depending on the way you express yourself, we, they're being prejudiced against. And, and this basically continues uh, inequality within those health centers. And this brings, of course, inequality in terms of uh, access to services. We also trained journalists so that they can provide accurate and true information. When you talk about abortion and you talk about gender, we have the feeling that we all kind of do our own thing. You provide information, but you're providing information that are not true messages uh, for somebody who really wants to build on, on gender equality. So what are we facing? We're facing with people that pretend they understand the gender issue, but they actually projecting their own or providing their own personal ideas. So we want to provide true, real information and maybe a solution to destroy everything that represents inequality within our society. So for us, this critical mass, we need to, we need to preserve it by providing true information and that way we should be able to contribute and deconstruct mentalities because all this social, because of all these social construct, let's say that I um, come from a family dad does this, mom does this, and, and then you pro you reproduce the same patterns. And so it is extremely difficult to, to leave those uh, old practices behind that are the results of inequality. So beyond those projects, we're talking about institutions, different structures that will enable us to look at things from a different lens through different programs, but also a different way of training the administration. We believe, we strongly believe that all those elements brought together are going to provide us with a, a fair fight to fight against the inequality. Thank you, Thank you Thank so you, much. Richard. I'm gonna uh, move us on now. Does anyone else wanna quickly comment on the gender equality piece? If, if not, I'd like to get into some specific sort of country examples of how we are working to, to break down these barriers. Um, and Riaz, it would be great to hear from you. Um, you did a really great job of setting the landscape for sort of how abortion legality fits into the bigger context in Mozambique. Can you talk a little bit about the ways you're working to break down some of those barriers and really what you see as the, the priority for advocacy within that context? Definitely. Thank you, Elisha. And, and definitely, I, I think I'll, I'm going to start to talk uh, building on what Fatou, Karen, and, and Bridget, they definitely mentioned. Because I think one of the core items that came through the, uh, throughout their, their interventions were, was gender, equality, autonomy. So this is really very interesting because this is the foundational work that we really uh, started to, to do and we worked uh, on that dimensions. So if we are talking about working in, a, in, a, in an environment to address stigma, discrimination, or to enable access, there are, we cannot only work in one dimension. We should work comprehensively. And that entails at least four dimensions, at least. One is at the indi individual level. And whenever we are talking about individual level, it, I think it's, it's key to empower women and girls on their rights because access to safe abortion, utilizing services of safe abortion is a matter of rights. Voice, agency, and bodily integrity. Because it is extremely important, each girl, woman, they know what, they, they, what their rights are and where they can get the services, what and where they can have those. And for that, just a, citing an example, we have been working in, in rural areas doing face-to-face -face interactions, having community health workers and even traditional birth attendants interacting, training, working with girls in school and out of the schools. And even this is uh, something that we have to start empowering and ensuring that 
gender dynamics, we can start changing those early ages. And it's not only when they are adolescents and uh, adults, but also in pre-adolescency is where we have to start working. So build in, and we do recall, there was a, one of the exercises that we started to do that was calling deconstructing masculinity, because we have to work with boys and uh, also with from, from early ages. So that's at an individual level dimension, I'll say. The second, I think it's, uh, it's tackling a bit on what Amos was talking about. It's enabling the, at the community and society level. It is extremely important to work with the communities and the society to really unlock access, reduce vulnerability and discrimination. And, and that, that's, that has been achieved from our work at, and experience throughout the different projects and work with the communities by working with key influencers. And I do recall that Amos was talking about being a country that expressed being a, a Catholic, if I'm not mistaken. So working with religious leaders has been one of the instrumental areas to achieve access to services and reducing those stigma and discrimination in selected communities as well. Something that we initially thought that it was really a burden or it would be impossible was to engage Muslim uh, uh, religious leaders or Catholic uh, religious leaders, but it was proven that there are uh, even in Quran or in the Bible, areas that they can use those versicles to really talk about it and enhance access to, uh, because none of the religion goes for, for that, it's for life. So we started to engage them and have, have them as advocates, but it doesn't uh, stop there. Uh, household heads are very important to that traditional birth attendance, because we have, for example, in a very rural areas, uh, initiation rights, for girls and traditional birth attendants and, and godmothers, that's how we call them. They are critical to provide that sexual education or reproductive health education to, to, to girls. And that's also one of the key areas to intervene. And one of additional uh, key influences that we have been working with and we have learned are the, the, the older women in each household as well, because they can be the blocker of access. The, the service providers are the third dimension that I will touch a little bit and it's critical because we there is a lot of publication across the world. We have done some, uh, but, but on the field, we also see it happening all the time, the provider bias, uh, having values of providers interfering in, in service provision, interfering in access to services. And, and, and that has, it takes long to really overcome. It is possible. And one of the key interventions that we have learned it is working is definitely value clarification sessions, having champions among health providers, not assuming that a project is making change, but identifying champions within their own uh, circle and then being vocal and talking about it. And lastly, I'll, I'll talk about uh, really closing this piece, the dimension of policy and, and decision makers. This is, might be something that why Riaz uh, uh, from a country where, where the legal framework is, is less restrictive, we'll talk about policy. Having a law that is re less restrictive doesn't make it everything happen because it, you do have a law, but implementation occurs at different layers. And if you just have a, a decision maker in a lower level that it is against, it will not allow uh, the, the services to happen smoothly. And even though if you have uh, a law that is less restrictive, at any time you can have step backs. And we have been seeing that in different uh, governments and different legislations happening that. So the continued advocacy and ensuring uh, key engagement and uh, from, from the policy makers and uh, influential people at the higher level is critical also to ensure and sustain the gains that we have been achieving throughout the period. And uh, some of those has been, for example, parliamentarians uh, from the Mozambican government that we have been working with, the, some of the ministers and the previous or past ministers as well. So I'll, I'll stop here for now. So thank, thank you. you.
Thank you, Riaz. That that's a great really overview of I think all the components needed to to really create this enabling environment, right? So that there is access and then it does progress. Um, it's a very good sort of pillar strategy. And and I'm going to turn to Amos because I, I know that you are, are sort of working through that strategy as well in Zambia. Um, and particularly around eliminating another barrier, which is the cost, right? And, and really getting government officials to partner with civil society in, in including abortion access within the universal health coverage planning. So Amos, over to you to talk a little bit about what you're doing in Zambia. Thanks, Elisha. Um, first and foremost, I want to emphasize that um, information is key. So as for us, Cray is working to ensure that uh, we have universal access for women to access sexual reproductive health services, including abortion services. One of the key issues that we have done as Zambian partners with other stakeholders, we have a coordinating group that is the Safe um, Abortion Advisory Group that looks at issues to do with safe abortion services. It's chaired by the Ministry of Health just to ensure that there is leadership from the government side. One of the things that we've also realized as stakeholders is that the cost has been a barrier for people to ensure that they have um, access to services. So from the year 2019, Zambia has introduced the health insurance and through that health insurance, as stakeholders, we had to advocate that we have reproductive health services actually embedded into uh, their benefits package. So I'm happy to actually inform you that um, one of the key outcomes that the package has actually come out with is that we have safe abortion services in there. Very, very clear and very, it outlines how you can actually access and how you can utilize the funds from the health insurance. Apart from that, we have also ensured that we have all methods of family planning uh, services apart from the two permanent methods. So right now we are working with the, um, the institution to ensure that we bring in BTL and visectomy to try and have all the methods be included in the uh, benefits package. I mean, it's critical that uh, health insurance is being uh, a driver for um, universal health access. So as CRE, we are working with all different stakeholders to ensure that these services are actually being provided. So right now we are at implementation stage. We want to ensure that when it comes to implement implementing Citizens, the women should have access to services that have been embedded in the benefits package. That way, they will be able to see that they have access to it. However, apart from that, if you remember in my earlier statement where I was talking about uh, service providers having a challenge to advance their values in providing the service, one of the key issues that we are also doing or key activities that we are doing is we are currently disseminating the standard and guidelines that have been developed to, to just show them that, look, there is a law, there are backups at national level, the Ministry of Health, which is their mother body, is actually working to ensure that there is access to reproductive health services, there is access for women to have these services, for them to ensure that we reduce maternal uh, deaths, to ensure that we reduce maternal mortality. So it's important that currently this dissemination actually reaches the lowest or the in the remote area um, institution that they are able to access these guidelines because then they'll be able to be informed in terms of what the law says, what are the guidelines, what's the standard, where should these um, safe abortion services be actually be provided. You see, one of the key issues that service providers need to know is that when a woman decides they're going to have a service, they will have it, whether safe or unsafe. So to ensure that there is universal access, right now we are ensuring that education is key, informing them about the law, and ensuring that the standards are actually upheld because we are also protecting women to access safe abortion services. There are already existing um, acts of parliament that I alluded to earlier on in terms of gender equality, in terms of uh, reducing GBV, that promotes and ensure that all human rights are are actually respected when it comes to issues of safe abortion. Thank you. Thank you, Amos. That's really, I mean, I'm, I'm hearing a lot. We're hearing a lot here about provider bias um, from everyone, which is, you know, I think something that we say, but uh, it's, it's great to hear some really proactive strategy to thinking about how we address that. 
And Bridget, I'm wondering if you could talk a, a little on that, particularly around youth in the context of Burkina in West Africa. I would love to hear about that provider bias component and what Pathfinder is doing, what you're doing in coalition to, to really reduce stigma as it comes when it comes to youth access to abortion services. Merci bien. Thank you so much. As far as youth in terms of a, a safe abortion, safe abortion in very, in very broad terms, what stands out is that within those health centers, we can observe youth that have to deal with that health workers that do not have the needs or, or the, the necessary information or the, comp the competencies. They're not trained. Those should be people that are supposed to provide answers to the youth. And those people are judging, they're being judgmental, they're discouraging those youth to have access to those services. And unfortunately, where those youth are hoping to find answers, they're facing those huge obstacles. And what are the consequences? They're having unsafe abortion, and which obviously complicates the, the whole the whole issue. Secondly, those health centers are not very welcoming. Those centers don't necessarily have the right equipment to meet the needs of those youth. And so those youth, again, they're not motivated. They don't find, they can't find the framework to exchange on a discrete basis or, or without being without being observed by the uncles or the aunts or or the the judge the judgmental people that are going to be admonishing or moralizing and however we have players on the civil society that work to reassure those youth and they work with technical partners so some centers some health centers were created who are more uh, youth friendly, where they can meet, they can exchange, they can communicate, they can obtain safe, true um, information to have safe access to abortion. And those youth sometimes uh, are being prejudiced. So and they, they, so they don't know those centers um, exist. Other points, there are different tools, communication tools that exist online where they can exchange on anonymously, where they can ask questions, maybe tough questions to ask if they were to do it um, in a non-anonymous way. And that way they can be provided with, with clear, safe information and they can also be provided, you know, addresses uh, about those centers that would be more, you know, youth friendly and safer. On a, pol a political level, there's a there's a section that is dedicated to youth and um, and uh, reproduction issues. And their role is also to provide them on a national level, but also regionally to provide information that's clear and safe. We also have, we can also observe new initiatives that are being set up to provide information to youth, but also to their parents. So that, you know, the youth are trying to, to turn to their parents um, Everybody's basically provided with the same, the same type of information. So this whole system allows us to have a better communication, more aligned information, better, uh, better communication. Of course, we're talking about the the cost issue because the cost can be. Um, uh, a problem to provide the services. 
There's also health centers that exist, but don't necessarily have the technical tools um, to provide those services, where the staff is not really qualified. And subsequently, they can't really provide the right um, the right care and, and communication to all these youth. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bridget. Um, I <laughs> that's that's a lot, and I think that it's clear that we need to really figure out some some country and global strategies around addressing the provider bias issue. <laughs> that's that's coming through from everyone's comments. Um, before we turn over to the um, audience for some some questions that have been coming into chat, I think you know we'd be remiss here if we didn't talk about all of this work, um, both the sort of access at service delivery, but also all of the advocacy work happening in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. And certainly right now, you know, unfortunately we're seeing a real resurgence of COVID and, and dangerous variants of it in many African countries. So I'd love to hear from any of the panel really how working through a pandemic has impacted not just the access piece, but also really your advocacy efforts. What has that meant as a civil society organization or Karen as a donor of how, you, how you've had to shift and pivot and, and really work to still achieve outcomes? Um, I can open the floor, anyone who would like to, to chime in. I see Amos, you're kind of nodding your head. So maybe we'll start with you and then go to Riaz and then Fatu. <laughs> Thanks, Elisha. I think it's, it's, it's really, really hard. If there's something that we did not expect in terms of the outcome, it's the COVID pandemic. I mean, first and foremost, let me begin by saying that in terms of our advocacy work, the most difficult part has been that, you know, automatically some processes, uh, stakeholders have been excluded. Okay, because of uh, the methods of the work that are happening. You know, when you are meeting, especially to do with advocacy, when you are meeting one-to-one, -one, you can have side discussions. You can't have side discussions online unless you call them, okay? So decisions <clears throat> that, have been, that have been made have been so difficult. But I must mention that even with that, with that one of the things that Zambia has done is that we've developed what we are calling the essential service guidelines to ensure that provision of contraceptives, safe abortion services continues. However, <clears throat> when we began with COVID, I think the message was that people needed to stay away from the facility. Okay, that itself, you know, had a huge impact on the citizens. Even up to now, people actually have an attitude of not going back to the facility. So one of the things that we have seen is that we have seen an increase in teenage pregnancy, when you talk about reproductive health in general. And then we have also seen, I mean, we haven't, there hasn't been any study to show exactly what, um, in terms of the statistics in, of unsafe abortion. However, we have seen the numbers in terms of um, teenage pregnancy. We have also seen the numbers of um, reduction to access for family planning services. That itself tells you that people are actually staying away from the facility and we need to do a lot of behavior change communications to encourage people to go back and start accessing normal services. Additionally, you know, because of closures of schools, that has also contributed highly to a number of gender inequality. Above all, I think we are also trying by all means to use social media to encourage people to seek these services. Over. Thank you, Amos. Riaz, do you want to jump in here? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Elisha. So first, I think uh, building on what Amos was talking about is what we started to see once the COVID pandemic hit the, the country. And I think we are now going to the third wave. Mozambique has entered. Uh, I can now we can now say on the third wave, we are growing, having more than 500 cases per day since this week. So first was the impact on the service delivery, as Amor was talking about, we started to see the decrease in, in, in seeking services, not going to the health facilities, but at the same time at the health facility level, providers getting a bit concerned and afraid of being at the health facility, considering that it's a high risk uh, place and as broadly known, 
the unavailability of PPE equipment for providers. So uh, uh, making even worse that service, service provision availability. The, and this definitely, uh, and, and on top of that, we started to also see the rotational schedule of for work that limited availability of providers as well, the other uh, prioritization in, at certain play, uh, moments uh, based on the different uh, guidance from the presidential recommendation and, and all the community-based services halted initially. So this, all was impacting the service delivery, but that was not all, but we started also see that demand for services also started to reduce, misinformation uh, being spread out very fastly, uh, clients, patients not willing to go to the facility considering that, that the health facility are places where they really can get COVID, meets and misconception and even the, the lockdowns or the limitation of or curfews reducing access to facilities but this is a new era that we are living in and as as uh, public health workers we learn that we have we cannot just sit and watch we we had to really learn adapt and start working and that's uh, where we work at, at three layers. One, at, with MOH, we started to immediately work on, on aligning training packages, moving and, and starting to have more visual training, coaching for health providers, and even enabling the, the hotlines so they could assist and guide uh, clients to the facilities and provide some counseling. So trainings, meetings, moving to that level, but also at the service level, we started to work to see how we could all partners convene together, see who, uh, who is uh, mapping uh, partners, government resources, and see how we can definitely better uh, allocate PPE resources, but also ensure information for health providers and assistance. Uh, and we prioritize working with the, the, the hotlines, with the, the provincial directorates. Uh, we started to have a bit on the telehealth and scheduling and um, on phone follow up. But something that we wanted really to, to have on board, but it was not possible, uh, definitely was as many other countries started on self care and self administration that was not definitely advanced in in Mozambique at the beneficiary level we we were able to really advocate and resume the the community based services on inform, providing information and the entry point that we used and we learned from that was it it is you cannot completely block community based services but you you can you uh, have the COVID education and sensitization as an entry point. And for that, you can start advocating and showing washing hand uh, using tippy tap models, uh, uh, using the, the cloth based uh, made masks to, to be used. And those, uh, so you, you are doing two at once. You are talking about the sexual reproductive health, including access to contraceptive services and abortion services, while you are also delivering uh, COVID prevention messages. So that's how it, it, it was possible to, to proceed and also to provide virtual support. Uh, on, in a nutshell, we, we learned three things uh, key uh, to, to ensure continuation. One was we had to be proactive. So proactivity was key because we had to think new every day to ensure that we can do something, we can overcome many of the recommendations and ensure uh, activities, for example, community dialogues, community gatherings were not allowed, but gathering up to nine people were, were allowed. So ensuring physical distancing, using masks and tippy tap for hand wash, we were able to conduct some of the community dialogues uh, and, and, and using that as an entry point. PPE was crucial to ensure that health providers continue to provide services. And lastly, not less important, it was key to predict, to ensure that commodities are available, to predict, to see that based on all these limitations, they are going to have stock out, occur stockouts, how we can better uh, reallocate resources and to ensure continuation of services. Not always is possible. We face stockouts of 
uh, combi packs, the mesomethane country, but we were able to at least think starting to use mesoprostol while we don't have uh, mesomethane, uh, at least getting ahead and, and innovating all the time, like proceeding and, and ensuring that services that doesn't stop. Thank you. Thanks, Riaz. That was a great comprehensive answer. I think you're reflecting on things that many countries have been struggling on. We do have a couple of questions for the, from the audience, and I got a one-minute warning, but I, I want to just give Fatu and Karin just a very quick comment, if you have one, on this the COVID issue. Fatu, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So I, I totally agree with the fellow panelists, so Amo and Ryan. So it was really challenging. COVID was a huge challenge, a challenge at all levels. But uh, across many programs, uh, MSI was also able to successfully advocate with partners to ensure that contraception, safe abortion, post-abortion care are defined by government as essential services and thus made available in the basic package of service. So I think that is also very important. There were possibilities to really work with uh, uh, um, com competent authorities uh, and to ensure that despite COVID, uh, communities had access to contraception, post-abortion care and abortion care. And I also want to highlight that uh, one of the few good things that came out, out of COVID, if one can say so, is actually that uh, the revolution in terms of telemedicine, right, and medical abortion. So for instance, in South Africa, in the UK as well, and uh, it has shown that uh, uh, it is well received by clients when done properly, and also that uh, it is as safe as it is as uh, any medical ab uh, abortion provided in facilities when obviously under the condition that it's done properly. So I think this is obviously an uh, inno innovative way to also think about uh, safe abortion care. And uh, yeah, since time is really short, I will just leave it there. Thanks. I, thank you, Fatu. I know there's a lot to say about the telemedicine revolution, and I think that's that's great. I'm going to give Karin. I would love to hear actually the donor perspective on how you've uh, dealt with um, funding during COVID and working with partners at country level. Yeah. Just very brief. Um, COVID, of course, struck us all um, instantly and, and like a, an instant crisis. What we tried to do was to learn from from previous crises of the same kind, Ebola being one, and, and there are other, other such crises. And when looking at that, there were two, two areas that we decided to continue funding and also fund a little bit more, actually. One is uh, the broad SRHR agenda, knowing that many donors would, would move to funding COVID instead of SRHR. And, um, uh, safe abortion care and safe abo everything around abortion is, of course, an integral part of this agenda. The other part is that we meant we financed uh, increased our finance actually to against misinformation <laughs> uh, to journalists, uh, information centers, uh, websites, organizations like yours, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in different ways to to hinder misinformation to to spin around and to make it possible for for the ones wanting to provide the right kinds of information around COVID, but also around other things like abortion, like sexual education or whatever uh, during the COVID period. Therefore, we also focused on, on information and correct information being provided to, to people around the world. But it was, of course, a debate from the beginning. Many or some in our country also wanted us to move the, the broad health uh, communication gender support to other areas, more uh, immediate when it come, came in the, in the wake of COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, that's, that's great. Um, I think everyone appreciates the flexibility <laughs> during this time. And I know that we had all thought and hoped it would be done by now. Unfortunately, um, it isn't. And so we're still wrestling with that. And I think we'll have a really long-term impact on all of our advocacy and, and vision for safe abortion access and gender equality moving forward. I'm gonna turn now to some questions and comments that have been posted in the chat. Um, and actually Fatu, I'm gonna put this first question to you. It was, it's really centered around Zimbabwe, um, but the commenter noted that across the, the countries discussed and the advocacy strategies, 
one of the things that is really needed is increasing government ownership of abortion care and services. Um, and how, how do we do that? I'm gonna start with you as MSI because I know you're working on this for a number of, of countries and you've put quite a few strategies in the chat, so thank you. Um, but if there's something in particular you wanted to highlight just on that increasing the government ownership piece so that it really becomes part and parcel of healthcare delivery from a government perspective. Yes, thanks. So as I already mentioned in the chat, so I think a statutory instrument that streamlines all the administrative requirements for rape survivors could be really transformative, right? So, and it's also important that the judiciary, police provider, so all decision makers, those who are needed to really issue authorizations for rape victims or authorization for access to safe abortion in general, are aware of the uh, rights of uh, survivors and are also supported. So values clarification, help increase knowledge and acceptance of women's rights to abortion at all levels is in society is critical. In terms of national ownership, I think it's also important to have uh, 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 not only national ownership, but also in terms of sustainability, I think it's important to have mo modules, right, in, for providers. So that uh, providers pre-service uh, uh, and in-service that are really trained because as my colleague already mentioned from Burkina and elsewhere, if providers are not trained, if they are not sensible, you can have good laws, but it will not uh, translate into quality access for men, women on the ground. And uh, obviously it's also important that uh, governments allocate resources in terms of commodities, supplies, and as mentioned, training and also for, for uh, magistrates at, or medical district magistrates to also be uh, sensitive to the issue because at the end of the day, they have a lot of power when it comes to how resources are distributed at lower levels. So very important to have national level advocacy guidelines, be cared, but we have to cascade it down to those people who really have the decision that have an, impact on women's access on the ground. I think that is often overlooked. We often focus on the national level, which is very important, but we really need to think what are the things that needs to be in place for women to de facto, so not only de jure, but de facto have access to safe abortion. Thanks. Thank you, Fatu. That's actually a great segue into a question that we got for Karin around um, what kind of work CEDA is doing or funding around training for local community women and untrained midwives and really bolstering that all access model that Fatu just highlighted in increasing um, trained healthcare providers, capable healthcare providers throughout a country, not just sort of in the capital. Karin, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, just uh, but we are train we are supporting both the training of midwives as such, but also traditional um, uh, midwives. I was about to say I, I don't remember what it's called, uh, but uh, people working out in in the country with with the the, the easy birth, so to say, uh, we're doing that via local organisations. Uh, in uh, often we're in support with different kinds of national structures in in many countries. There is a need, a great need for more trained midwives, but also uh, women, it's mostly women uh, taking care and helping hel helping deliveries to be more safe actually out in, in all parts in all countries. So we're trying to look at the both, both sides in the countries where we are active. Thank you, that's I'll great. Stop there to not be too long. No, no, that's terrific. Um, I know there's now a lot of, a lot of activity in the chats. Um, I'd like to, to ask Riaz and Amos both, there was a question about um, having dialogues with religious and cultural leaders. Both of you mentioned this as you were giving your um, overviews and discussions about sort of the context and what advocacy is happening in country. Riaz, I, I remember you mentioning working with Muslim leaders. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? And then Amos, I'd love to hear from you too about uh, what that looks like in Zambia, which has identified itself as a Christian country. <laughs> Go ahead, Riaz. Sure, definitely. And actually, actually, I'll I'll just start uh, by showing you know when we these are. Uh oh, okay. We there are some publications that we worked in the past in sexual reproductive health in Nigeria uh, with the Muslim community and, and Christians to really uh, working with uh, the priests and Olamash 
so we could really see how we can bring in the the sexual reproductive health in a comprehensive manner uh, to 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 start that discussion at different layers. So particularly, we started that discussion in in, in Maputo City from one of the projects that we were implementing uh, with Muslim leaders and with priests from the uh, Catholic Church. Uh, through VCAT sessions, that's where we started to see that many of them were aware about cases of girls, adolescents, and youth dying due to unsafe abortions. All of them were acknowledging that there are girls dying due to uh, unsafe abortion because this, uh, this is happening. This is not something that is not taking place. It happens. We cannot, and it was a wording from, from some of them that we cannot just close our eyes and assume that it's not happening just because it's, it's um, not what we like to hear or to see. So that started, but that, this is not like, a, 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 we say, a sea of roses, you know? It's not that every leader is on favor of it. But, but definitely we started to identify those champions and we, we started to bring them into other sessions for value clarification uh, where they were able to really talk about their own views, experience and bringing versicles from Quran or from the, the, the Bible, talking a little bit, uh, expressing that and bringing that discussions during their community events and community dialogues with other non religious leaders, because there are some of those community leadership meetings that entails the, the, the teacher from the community, like the, the, that if, uh, we call uh, um, pedagogical influence zone, where you have one like uh, teacher representing the, that area, you have a, a birth attendant, you have health provider, you have a religious leaders and traditional uh, court leaders and things like that. So they started to bring those, some of those discussions on the table and it really started to, to go somewhere. It is still a long way to go. We definitely understand that. We have started recently, and, and this is not only about abortion services, but it, it goes beyond that. It, it entails also the early child force marriages, for example, the unions, the premature unions, are how we are calling, uh, and although the law is prohibiting clearly now, but it is uh, still happening. And so bringing all this together as a gender and empowering discussion and accessing to, to, to services has been critical. So I think this, is, uh, this has been a very keen entry point for discussion on the impact that this is bringing in. I just want to add one point, a part of the religious piece is the, the, the evidence generation on, on, on abortion related uh, issues, it's still very weak. At least in Mozambique, we need to invest a lot uh, in providing data-based uh, decision-making to generate evidence because currently we, what, whatever we talk is, okay, maternal mortality, 11% are contributed, attributable to, to, to unsafe abortion. But okay, but what, what is the problem when we are talking about abortion, unsafe abortion and, and de uh, digging a bit uh, deeper on that? And that is something that is required. So I think that's one of the, those investment areas that is required for, for further um, opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Riaz. Hey, Mrs. Do you want to chime in on that briefly? I know we're we're almost at time, and I do want to give everyone a chance to sort of make a closing advocacy statement. <laughs> but sure. do you want to I, say I something our, about our, the Zambia our, context? Sure. I, I mean, there's no there's no much difference between what Riaz has, has said and what I'm going to uh, quickly allude to. I think I will pick on on what you were saying. I think the most weak point that we have also identified is that um, there is very weak um, studies that are going on around safe abortion and unsafe abortion, both at community level and also at national level. That's, I mean, an investment that we quickly need to, to, to use and look into. But again, when it comes to discussion with um, religious leaders, I mean, I'll use my personal experience and it's that I believe that the last thing you want to do as an advocate is to ask the religious leaders to support you in your 
area of advocacy for abortion, they won't do it. So the best method I have found to do is that you ask them not to be negative on abortion. That's the best you can do. That's the best you'll get out of it. Once you do that, you'll be on the same table. So one of the examples you use is, listen, you give them, like Raya has said, you give them examples of the numbers of people dying from unsafe abortion, the numbers of people, that's the evidence you give them. And then you go further and tell them, say, look, as much as this is happening, we are not asking you to support this, but we are asking you not to discriminate, not to condemn, then you'll be on the same platform. I mean, when it comes for us, our entry point has been reproductive health, teenage pregnancy. And we've seen a lot of champions from religious circles who are supporting family planning. You know, we, we have a number of them. They're supporting family planning services. They're speaking to their congregates. That has helped us to ensure that the, the congregate actually are on the same table. And what we've only asked them is, please do not discriminate when it comes to abortion. After all, none, the Christian and the, the Muslim, none of the, the practices actually asks for discrimination. It actually asks for promoting positivity. That's how we've handled it. Over. Thank you, Amos. I think uh, that silence is golden piece is uh, <laughs> part of the key to this. I, unfortunately, I know we have other questions, but we're, at, we're actually at time here. Um, I'm going to thank you all for such a wonderful and robust panel and so many insights. I was hoping we would have some time for sort of everyone to give a closing statement, but I think we're, we're at that. I, I actually, Karen, you sort of opened us a closing, closing sentence. A big thank you to you leading us through this. And I will not try to summarize what everyone <laughs> said, but just two important takeaways, which they are evident, but anyway, needs to be underlined. All actors are important. Uh, civil society, government officials, politicians, decision makers, religious leaders have been spoken around, but also the private sector should be drawn into this uh, in different ways. So all actors, and we must work in partnership. The other thing the is what has been pointed out uh, or underlined by all of us nearly is uh, the need for context specific ways of uh, tackling the issue. Uh, the, the goal is always the same, the right for everyone to choose and bodily autonomy, but how we frame it and how we work with it will vary from country to country and from context to context. We all still have the challenge. In the north, in the south, in your part of the world, in my part of the world, they vary, they, it looks, it has different faces we must interact and learn from each other. So thank you very much for organizing this webinar. Thank you, Karin, that's a perfect ending. You brought us right back to that need for the movement building approach and partnership to, to really move this agenda forward. Um, perfect ending note. I'd like to thank all of the panelists and all the participants, our interpreters, thank you. And also thank you to all the staff at Pathfinder PAI and all the participating panel organizations that helped to, to pull this together and, and make it a really terrific panel. And I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.